Hello, everybody. Welcome on the Innovation and Strategy blog. Today, we're continuing our Zoom interviews that we started during the pandemic. And I'm really happy to uh, initiate a conversation with uh, Gérard de Bourbon. Um, Gérard, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I've been working uh, in um, both the finance and software industries for, for many, many years. I have a multicultural background. Uh, it's been a great deal of my, you know, schooling and adult life in the U.S. And then I moved to, to Sweden, uh, where I'm located now with my family. Uh, currently engaged in, in um, uh, with INL, the you know International Nanotechnology Laboratory, uh, which is a multidisciplinary, uh, multi-government international institution, and then also working with. Uh, uh, other software engagements. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Great. Um, so we, this is actually the, your second time on our, um, on our Zoom interviews. The first time we had talked a lot about the innovation, uh, digital innovation, and digital transformation, cultural change also. That's one of your areas of um, expertise. Correct. And uh, you've been also a pretty vocal, um, a vocal commentator. Um, on the matter of the pandemic and its management. We know that this is putting a lot of different governments in conditions of stress uh, because it's, you know, no, all of this is new to us. And um, so I thought that maybe you actually recently wrote an article on LinkedIn uh, where you talked about how different countries are managing the pandemic and maybe we can take it from there if that's okay with you. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, so basically uh, just to, put the context in very broad terms. Obviously, different countries have reacted differently um, to this pandemic event. And you feel like, if I understand your reading, your, your writing, that um, uh, the United States and Europe could learn a lot from a number of Asian countries. So exactly. could you perhaps tell us about some of the Asian countries that you feel are, have managed this in an interesting manner? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, the first one that comes to mind is Taiwan, right, and, and, and Hong Kong. Uh, not only from the, the type of leadership perspective they had from the beginning, and, and, and obviously some people will say that, that it's unfair to compare uh, you know, Taiwan and Hong Kong or Korea, South Korea or Japan with, uh, with other countries in Europe or the, or the Americas, but uh, because they, they were hit before, uh, by this, the previous SARS virus, but um, you know what what struck me, uh, you know, of a huge contrast early on, is that whilst many countries in Europe and in the U.S. sort of denied the the severity of the virus, um, the countries that succeeded actually took a, a very transparent approach to their population by communicating clearly. And, and directly and, and not minimizing the, the severity and the danger of the virus uh, ahead, but asking for the collaboration and total collaboration from the public. And I mean, if you look at Taiwan, I mean, Taiwan, they, they didn't close schools. They didn't have a massive lockdown. Uh, people collaborated, they wore masks. Uh, they did a lot of testing, isolation of those infected and contact tracing. And combined with the normal hygiene and all the things that uh, social distancing that 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 are common sense nowadays, right? And then you look at uh, Korea uh, in in uh, in Hong Kong, uh, which have had a lot of experience already on this before. Uh, they also handle things uh, in a in a you know pretty clever way. Uh, and then now you know if you take Japan for an example. You know, I actually thought that Japan was going to get hit really, really hard, especially because they sort of delayed things and they sugarcoated the message, uh, hoping that they could save the Olympics um, and, and sort of started reacting late. But then again, the, the, the collaborative spirit and the, the, the population uh, already being used to wearing masks made a huge, huge difference. Now, and there, there are different opinions about wearing masks, and I, I, I'm not saying that's the answer of everything, uh, but, but they do help. 
dramatically. Well, actually, but, let me ask you a few questions just on what you yeah. just said. Yeah. Um, so actually, there'll be a number of different questions. I'm yeah. struck by the fact that we've heard very little of Taiwan and how they managed yeah. their pandemic. So maybe there's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, I, I have to say that each of the three countries you mentioned are islands. I, I, correct. In, uh, in, except for maybe Hong Kong, which has got some, uh, you know, yeah. something. Uh, but you know, what they did is they mitigated the flow of, the, of, uh, of traffic, right? Taiwan early on mitigated that by, by you, know, uh, you know, stopping flights. But I mean, what, look at Vietnam. That's not an island. No. Very low death rate. Very little resource. Yes. But good collaboration from the, the, the people. And what's the population of Vietnam? What is it, like 90 million, I think? You know, I could, I'm guessing now. But I think it's, you know, anywhere from 70 to 90 million. That's a huge delta. I don't have the number right off the top of my head. But it's a huge population, right? Uh, they managed to, to mitigate that. Right, with very little resource, uh, very little testing, but the collaboration of people. And that's not an island, right? And I know New Zealand that did really well was all, it's an all, also a series of islands, right? So uh, some people might say, well, yes, it's unfair to compare because they're islands. But, you know, the, the, the facts are still there on the table that the countries here in Europe that reacted well, like Germany, Norway, Finland, uh, and, and I mean, Portugal, they did quite well as well. They managed to, to have a pretty, I would say, to mitigate the number of deaths and the number of infections. Right. Now, uh, let me give you another. Um, so, I understand that, you know, it's easier when you're an island. Although, yeah. that doesn't mean that when you're an island that you can, that it's a free ride, but. Another, some other people have said that those Asian countries have developed more experience on managing pandemics because they had to deal with stress in a way that Western Europe had not. Precisely. And this is what I said earlier, that, that you know, I, I, of course, you can give the benefit of the doubt to a number of other countries because, yes, the Asian countries, especially Hong Kong, they've been hit before by the former SARS virus, right? Uh, not once, but twice, right? So they have had a bit more experience in handling this. But, but if you look at, at the, the different epidemiologists from different countries, and take Sweden for an example, I mean, these people went publicly and they claimed they've been preparing for a crisis like this their entire careers, right? Mm -hmm. And the same thing when, goes for the US, the same, same thing goes for other countries in Europe. If you've been preparing for this, where was the protective equipment? Where, where were the resources? You know, why didn't you know what to do? It's not because the data wasn't there, because there was a lot of data already available in January, right? Uh, you know, look, we, the way I see it, in having a, a military background uh, in, in an academy school from, uh, you know, military academies, uh, you know, studies, you know, this type of situations are no different than, than war, right? We've been fighting a nearly invisible enemy that is trying to kill us or infect us and some of them, you know, will die as a result. You know, in, in times of war, it's nothing but an operations, quick reaction and logistics type operation, right? Mm -hmm. And... I mean, look at the amount of money that the U.S. is spends in military or what we've been doing in NATO. We're holding exercises. And 700 billion. Crisis. Yeah. And why, why didn't we do exercises for pandemics? And what are we doing for the next big wave? Bless you. Or the new, uh, uh, or a new hit coming up. Or, or look, there are over a thousand viruses out there potentially, you know, waiting to be released. And if you look so, at can, history, can I ask you a question? Um, yeah, yeah. You used the term war. Yeah. Um, in France, the president uh, Macron used the term war on his first speech to the nation. Yeah. And um, I think it was in early March. Mm -hmm. I believe it was March 12th. I'm not sure. I remember. Yeah. And there's been a huge controversy um, in, that spawned a lot of different topics. But let's look at one of them, which is the question of um, medicine. Yep. Those that say that um, when you're 
doing, when you're in a war, your way to cure people is different from when you're at peace. So for example, when you're in peaceful times, you can be very rigorous and you can really follow science by the line, so to speak. Yeah. And actually time, time you can be, uh, take time um, and be sure that you're doing the right thing. On the other hand, when you're at war, time is of essence, so you really need to um, be fast and efficient, even if that means um, sort of sidestepping a lot of the conventional scientific methods. Do you feel like our countries in Western Europe and perhaps also in the United States, have had too much of a peace-minded approach to managing the virus and not one that's uh, dealing with the urgency of the situation? Yes, I do. And if you listen to and see the videos, you can go back to some of the videos from early or late January from Dr. Ryan from the World Health Org that has been on the forefront of the Ebola pandemic and so on. Uh, you know, he kept saying, Act now, act now. Perfection is the enemy of good, right? Act, act, act. And, and he did mention also war, right? War-like responses. Um, you know, because of course, I mean, people were like, oh no, we cannot do contact tracing because of our privacy or because of this. Look, I mean, in, in reality, the way I see it, it's the virus, imagine if there were a bunch of snipers out there that are taking our citizens. Mm. And every time you go out, the chances are someone is going to get hit. Mm -hmm. Your family, it could not be, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. we don't know, right? If that was the case, do we be as complacent as we are today? Right. Some people are like, no, I don't want to wear masks, or no, I don't want to do contact tracing, you know, or no, the vaccines, uh, you know, maybe they're going to be bad, or what if I get this? You know, people are dying, right? The bottom line is people are dying. Mm -hmm. And just because they're not our relatives or they're not our people that we might know, uh, these people have a name and they have families and they have uh, sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, whatever. You see what I mean? And, right. And we need to recognize that. And if they're our own, uh, perhaps we react differently. And this is why I keep, in a lot of the conversations I have with family, friends, and business associates, I do refer to the term a war. Uh, because that's how we should be preparing and that's how we should be reacting. Now, another of the countries... Yep, right. Um, so perhaps just to summarize our conversation so far, uh, we still have a lot of other topics to talk about. We talked about the fact that um, Asian countries, including Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan, and Vietnam, were more successful in managing the pandemic yeah. than um, a lot of Western countries. Uh, now, this is partly due to their geographic situation in the case of Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Japan as their islands. Yep. And also due to the fact that they have greater experience in the matter. But there is a sense of complacency in Western countries um, and perhaps a way of being slow to act that explained why a lot of Western countries uh, were not as prompt in dealing with the crisis as other countries. Although there is Portugal and Finland that you talked about that were Germany, I mean Germany is doing quite well. I think Germany did phenomenal, right? I think uh, considering this, their large population, I think they've done a great job. Angela Merkel, I think you got to take your head off uh, to her and her government because they've done they've done a great job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now um, there's another another country in the list that you had mentioned in your article, and that's Rwanda. Yep. Which is not an Asian country, as it's in Africa, yeah. obviously. So tell me about Rwanda. Why did well, make I mean, what, I, what I see is, again, this is the, a similar example to like Vietnam, right? Is that countries with very little means, if they act and they work together with their citizens, they can make a huge difference, right? And the reason I, I, I brought Rwanda up is because of the contrast, right? I mean, look, I live in Sweden, and this is a country that's highly advanced. We have a very highly educated populace, you know, you know, the, the, the educational level is, is, is high. We have, you know, huge global multinationals with a lot of resources. And we have the highest death rate, you know, per million than a lot of countries in the world, right? And if you compare to our neighbors, which are the closest comparison to what we have, 
I mean, look at the death rate in Norway or Finland or Denmark. And I mean, the health authorities here in Sweden would want to tell you that no, we should not be comparing to our neighbors. We should be compared more to Belgium or the Netherlands or the UK. But that's rubbish because they have a highly densely populated uh, and, and larger population. So it, 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 it's bogus to compare to them. I mean, what we have experienced here in Sweden is unprecedented. First, they went for herd immunity, then they said, no, we're not. And now they're banging the herd immunity drum once again. Uh, we have had a lot of people that, that died because of plain denial of healthcare, right? Uh, you know, people, uh, I happen to know a former colleague, a 42 year old lady that died. Uh, and uh, basically, she was told to stay home and, uh, until she got really bad. And the problem when you, when you get really bad is that the infection might be all over your body and you just don't have time. Mm -hmm. And then a 50-year-old neighbor, also a very healthy person, doing a lot of sports and, and CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And uh, he passed away basically about a week after he called, right? And again, they told him to stay home because these are the rules. And if you look at the contrast in other countries like Portugal and others where they treat you early and they bring you in because they understand that, you know, it's a lot easier to triage and treat a person in a more relaxed environment rather than to have to triage, you know, people and be saving their lives, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think what, what happens in a sense, the, the, the politics of, of Sweden here, I mean, they wanted to keep this number of ICU beds or, or, or intensive care beds, you know, uh, at about a 20% free ratio. Mm -hmm. And they always kept saying, no, we still have 20% free beds, we have 20% free beds. But in reality, people were just not allowed to go to the hospital. Right. You know, wow. Unless you were really, really bad. Mm. Uh, and, and, it, and, it's, and if you look at the, the people that have perished here in Sweden, it's a little bit over 50% elderly, many of them which were euthanized because they were given opioids and benzos and they were denied oxygen and when when they give you you know uh, opioids and, and, and benzos you know basically you relax and they put you to sleep and, and you're gone right mm -hmm. uh, whereas in other countries they gave you oxygen early on uh, so those were the over 50 percent of people of the population that died the elderly and care homes uh, and then a lot of other people you know, died because again, I think they we waited too long to bring them in, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's not right. Obviously, the government and the the, the 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 public health authority has a different story, but I can tell right. you that there are many many people here uh, disagree. With that. Yeah. So um, maybe I'd like to ask you two more questions, if that's okay with you. Uh, one question. Rel uh, relative to the question of uh, consumer confidence and more broadly the economic consequences of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, maybe just to give you an, a sense of what I've been reading and then perhaps you can tell me about your impressions. Uh, I've been mostly reading about the fact that this is disrupting, dis disrupting existing supply chains. Yes. They tended to be globalized uh, where each country has its own sort of expertise and and a global company like they are in Sweden would sort of um, pull the best countries that have the best resources for a specific task and then would assemble all of what they needed to get assembled in some country with great manufacturing abilities like China or perhaps even Vietnam. And some people are saying that the supply chain is will be more localized now. And so this is creating a much more regionalized, regionalized kind of um, uh, sort of production model. What are what are the? Uh, I know you have also views on the consumer's point of view. What are your views on the matter? Well, I mean, overall, I I agree that we need to start localizing things more and and consume less and be dependent less dependent on the world's factories, so to speak. Right. I think Europe needs to start manufacturing more here. We need to start consuming more locally. Uh, the same goes for foods, right, and veggies. I mean, we, here in Sweden, we import a great deal of our food, right? And it wasn't like that in the old days. So I think we need to start cultivating more and, and fomenting the growth of a localized type approach 
or at least regionalized or nearby, right? Uh, because of the, the disruption of supply chain. I mean, you know, the dependence on the world's factory, that has to end, right? I mean, sorry, you know, French and China, but, uh, but we need to do something, right? Because you can't get caught again uh, unprepared. When it comes to consumer confidence, I mean, uh, it's not just me saying that. I mean, the evidence is there. You have companies like McKinsey, Gartner, you know, Harvard Business Reviews, many large publications saying, look, if you save livelihoods, you, if you save lives, you save li livelihoods, because it's a natural reaction of people that if you feel unsure about your job, about the economy, about people dying, you naturally will consume less, right? You would rather not travel, you try to save, you, you, you hoard your resources, uh, and, and uh, you're gonna spend less. I mean, if we've been confined, I mean, I've been at home since, since this thing started, and I can tell you that I don't think about things that normally you would think, oh, maybe I need to buy a new shirt or new pants or shoes or something like that. It hasn't even crossed my mind, right? Mm. Uh, and the reason is, I mean, you're not out, right? Right. And, yeah. and, and that has an effect on, on multiple, you know, on businesses and so on. I mean, uh, you know, so it, it, and that goes for eating out and takeout and things like that. I mean, it affects everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I do believe and I agree with these articles and these giant, uh, you know, analyst firms that, that really believe that, that yes, if you invest on, on getting people to feel good, mm -hmm. the economy will rebound. And that goes along, along for healthcare, right? Um, I really believe that we need to start investing on preventive healthcare and in predictive healthcare with tools like AI and, and, and you know, analytics and so on, uh, because we really have to change. I mean, currently here in Europe, we spend 98% of our total healthcare budget treating sick people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's just no longer sustainable, right? And if you add to the equation the, the, the migration flux that we're having coming in with all the migrants, right. the, the system will go belly up. We can't sustain that. So what we need to do is to flip the pyramid upside down and spend money on treating the healthy so that we don't get sick. Right? right. This is where preventive rehab type approach, you know, preventive healthcare, you know, doing exercise, wellness, uh, you know, nutritional medicine, uh, you know, all these things will have a bearing on our well-being. Right. And, and if we are feeling better, we are naturally going to consume that, right? Absolutely. When this nightmare is over and we're all, uh, you know, allowed to go out and be back to a, to a new normal, I think the economies will rebound faster. And, and the, the virus, I mean, the data is there, right? That the virus is not only, uh, you know, killing the people that have severely been affected. The data is there that there are many people that are asymptomatic or mild symptomatic that have lung damage, they have a series of gastrointestinal problems, that have, uh, you know, nerve damage, out of a lot of, a slew of issues, right? And, I mean, these people will become the next mining towns of the future. Right. And the first hit with a new strain or a new wave or a new virus, right? Right. Uh, and, and this is the thing that we need to mitigate and the questions that we should be asking to our governments and our localized type uh, bureaucrats and politicians to say, look, what are we doing for the next virus? What are we doing to prepare? Are we going to be, be doing the same thing where we are reactive rather than proactive? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I think that would be a shame on, on all of us, right, if we don't. Right. Uh, so, so maybe one last, um, one last question. Yeah. Um, on the sort of geopolitical, geostrategic level, yeah. um, as you know, we're in a moment when um, we've got two superpowers one that's emerging and one that's established. The United, yeah. United States is established superpower and China is an emerging superpower. And you may be familiar with um, um, the ideas of Thucydides, 
um, yeah. where when there's a rivalry between two um, superpowers, and more specifically when there's one ascending superpower that will topple um, an established one, he, he showed in a historical survey looking at 2,000 years that in the 16 times that there's a change in superpower, 16, 1, 6, uh, um, 12 times, so that's three out of four, there was a war. Well, um, do you feel like the pandemic is um, sort of reshaping the geostrategic dialogue? Um, I know that in, it seems to me that at least in Europe, the view of China is different than it was before. Um, China was considered to be a sort of benevolent, com commercially driven superpower, and now it's considered differently with the pandemic. Um, the United States, with uh, President Trump, had a more harder view on China. But do you feel that this is the pandemic is changing our um, the world order in some way or, or other? Absolutely, and and here in Europe, we need to wake up and smell the coffee and and bring solidarity in, in, and keep that in mind and start working cohesively together amongst all the EU countries uh, to come out of this ahead, right? Because otherwise, you know, we will be part of this divide and conquer uh, and, and be split up. Um, and, you know, we, we will be in trouble, actually. I mean, China, right now, since they've been managed to, to you know, they managed to mitigate the, the virus, uh, you know, very well, I would say, and hats off to the Chinese. I mean, it's a different type of government, but they, they did manage to, to, to handle it, right? Uh, but what they're doing in the meantime is, while the, the rest of the world is busy, they're making the moves in different areas, right? With right, the exactly. Home and, 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 and their sites in Taiwan right now, I think that's an, an abomination, right? Uh, but then if you look at all the other stuff that they're doing where they're suddenly sending massive sh ships of, uh, you know, fleets of ships to, to take advantage of, 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 you know, different, you know, nations, navies not monitoring, you know, their fisheries. I mean, look, they just got caught in the Galapagos with, with uh, you know, 300 tons of, uh, of fish in just a few vessels, right? Illegally caught uh, fish, sharks. Uh, but I mean, if you look at the Maldives, you know, the, the, the Pacific, right. South Pacific, I mean, mantas, whale sharks, I mean, they're, they're really going nuts on that because nobody's really paying attention now, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, on the other hand, I mean, the stand too, I mean, they're, they're devastating and, and basically stealing stand from many countries, you know, especially in the Maldives for their construction needs, which right. is also completely below the belt, right? Right. Uh, so I think countries need to first be less dependent on Chinese goods and, and the world's factory. Uh, we need to start, you know, manufacturing locally, as I said earlier. And, and here in the EU and the, in Europe, we need to sort of solidify our approach and work together to prepare for the next hit. But I mean, I honestly think that the state right now is destabilized uh, because of Trump. I mean, they've lost, sadly, credibility in the, in the, in the, the world safe and if he gets reelected you know god willing he's not uh you know then i think the the, the states will will sink further in in and when you mentioned the dilemma of the 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 two pillars that have been sort of viewed as as the world powers mm -hmm. uh, i think china can come out ahead unless the the rest of the world sort of acts and mitigates that um you know and look hats off to the chinese uh from a planning perspective they're not the type of of society that plans for five years ten years ahead i mean these guys are planning 50 100 years ahead right, mm -hmm. right. Um, so that is a very different approach than what we do right and, clearly uh, we, we tend to have quarterly plans <laughs> no i don't think so I mean, I think they're very long-term focused. And no, I was saying Western countries tend to be a quarterly, uh, yeah. tend to plan things on a quarter-by-quarter quarter level. Exactly. And I mean, and that's sort of our proper problem here in Europe, right? That we're right. sort of short-term minded and we, we don't think that far ahead. 
and and we're also a bit more centric in our thinking and, and this is why i think a stronger eu and a eu working together will mitigate a lot of those issues in a more regionalized eu the stronger when it comes to sourcing manufacturing you know agriculture you know all that will will make a big big difference right uh, there is no reason why we shouldn't sort of have a resurgence of made in the eu and have that stamp as a as a you know quality um uh, approach to things you know in, in to conclude i think what we need to start thinking and i've said this to you before that i'm a firm believer that if on everything we do we first think planet people purpose and then profit in that specific order so the planet plan always comes purpose yeah. and profit yeah so the four p right yeah. planet people purpose profit always always think that way and the companies that actually put that in that specific order long term they are more profitable right mm. and that goes back to the old when we talk about uh, total quality management you know edward deming is one of my favorite right. you know guys and his books and so on by the way i have a couple of new books that i want to mention to you. but anyway um you know total quality management and constant never improvement is really about that it's a long term approach to looking at things and making little tweaks and improvements here and there we need to do that with our thinking we need to do that with our the way we view things and companies need to be more long term focused rather than, than uh, you know i want to make my my profit increase shareholder value as quickly as possible and then off we go right uh, those days need to end right uh, we need a longer term vision and capital and an investment um, otherwise i think we're going we're in going to we're going to be for a rough ride and god forbid if there is a war and let's hope it's not uh the the whole world is going to get destabilized right and, right. and uh, i'm a firm believer that we are a week away from anarchy in any given country right wow think about it right yeah if suddenly the shit hit the fan and you know electricity goes off water goes off you know yeah. here, what do we do here in northern europe Right. Food is mostly imported. Right. So what do we do? You see what I mean? Yeah. In France, you're better off in France because you have a lot of agriculture, you have a lot of natural resources, you know, less, you know, you know, seasonality. I hear we have two seasons in the north, right? You know, winter and you know, spring and a little bit of right. summer, right? So uh, when it comes to harvest, we might have one, right? Right. You know, whereas in France, you maybe have two, right? Right. Uh, so we need to start thinking. This is what I mean about thinking locally. What can we source? How are we going to eat in the future? You know, what do we do for protein? You know, how do we become healthier? This is where I believe that nutritional medicine uh, will play a huge, huge factor, especially if you have these millions of people affected by the virus with gastrointestinal issues. Right? Can mm -hmm. we get a real-time view of what food should I eat that's perfect for my gut? very right. different years and my my sons or my wives you know what i mean tailor made diets that are for me with the right. most optimum nutritional value rather than consuming all this crap that we put in i mean look i love cheese and i love bread <laughs> and a little bit of wine here and every once in a while but but you know there's a lot of foods that not necessarily agree with us and, and we don't know that we shouldn't be eating them right mm. Uh, All right. Well, there's a lot of stuff that we need to do, but but I I think to conclude, investing on people's well-being mm -hmm. will have a direct effect in a in a return on the investment mm -hmm. and recovery mm -hmm. in our economy. Oi, are you there? Yep. You on? Yep. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you sort of disappeared. No, no, uh, I'm here. I'm here. But we're reaching the uh, point of conclusion. Um, yes. So let me try to summarize what we talked about. Is, is that okay? Uh, I can't hear you anymore. I 
can you hear me? can you see me now yeah yeah so i'm just going to try to summarize and then we, we um i'm going to summarize our conversation yeah, yeah. so we talked about the fact that a number of uh asian countries were very successful in managing the pandemic these countries yeah. include uh three of three countries are actually islands including taiwan hong kong and japan vietnam is not an island but it was also very successful this is because they were prepared um, also because they were able to involve their their residents and population and sort of collaborative kind of uh, protective measures like wearing the masks. Um, it was also a fact that they looked at this matter like a question of war. When in Western countries um, that are tend to be used to living in peace, they, they were more into peaceful measures, which are also great, but much more slower to uh, put into to implement. Um, we talked about the fact that this is really changing the geostrategic landscape um, and our relationship to China. You mentioned that you think that we need to localize the supply chain much more than we are today. Yep. Um, and that there's a really a different way of looking at things. You talked about the four Ps. Um, so it's planet first, people second, um, purpose third, and finally profit. Yep. And this is uh, this would help companies uh, generate profits in the long term. Uh, a notion that we've forgotten in, the, in Western Europe since we tend to think quarter by quarter, whereas in, in China, people tend to have more of a long-term kind of thinking. Um, so I really wanted to thank you for uh, being on, our, on, on this interview. Um, and I'm hoping that we can perhaps talk again um, on some other topic. And uh, I hope that you have a great day. Yeah, and you. since you like books, Long Shots, Loon Shots is a really good book. I'm going to show it to you. Can you see it here? Yeah. And so maybe uh, we can do a, a video on that topic. Yeah. No, but I'm, I'm reading that. Or, you know, there are a couple, you know, I'm reading quite a few books. But, I mean, you asked about books last time. I, yeah. I really recommend this, this one. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a